Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. We own our stack, which gives us the ability to be profitable, but also our scalability. I mean, there is a reason why most now it's a bit now I know it's a bit under fashion, but why we are the go-to vendor for the crypto industry and the mobility one because you need instant verification in four to eight seconds. You cannot wait for a person to verify in a couple of minutes. That was Ron Otzman, the chairman of Authentics, and he is my special guest on this episode, episode 289 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. Authentics is a global identity intelligence leader that is on a mission to obliterate fraud and further a more secure and inclusive world. The company provides critical modular solutions to verify and link physical and digital identity so businesses and their customers can confidently connect. Ron and I talk about the company and what makes it unique in the marketplace. Ron also shares the fascinating story of Authentic's founding and the multiple pivots they've made along the way. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Ron. Thank you for being here and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Thank you very much, Greg. It's a pleasure being here. Great. So let's dive right in. If you don't mind, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that, and then we'll circle around to your professional career in a few minutes. I'm 49. I was born in Tel Aviv, lived a few years as a kid in London, then came back and then spent most of my childhood until then uh, in the service in the Navy for three years, and then uh, went straight to university. Started in accounting, to be honest, but eventually after three years, decided that okay, I'm not going to be an accountant. <laughs> so I changed my matter from business and accounting to marketing and human resources. And uh, during university, I've done some work a bit, then went into a bit project management and then done investment banking and then moved again to London to do my MBA in London, came back. And then uh, since 2003, for the last 20 years, I've been in the uh, hardcore, it was also before the tech world, but really hardcore tech startup. So that's me now still in Tel Aviv, four kids, happily married, trying to enjoy life. Well, let's talk about the company Authentics. So can you tell our audience what the company does? So Authentics is an identity company. We specialize in identity verification and management. So just to give you a bit of perspective, we deal with customer onboarding and re-verification of customers. So you probably met us in different processes, either in Airbnb or PayPal or Google or I mean, like on the crypto exchanges or when you get on a scooter like a bird. So that's us. So we deal with now they need to do onboarding or or they figure out that you might be a bit of like a dodgy person or the, a dangerous person. So then we do verification. So this is uh, so this is basically what we do in a nutshell. Are there certain industries or verticals that you focus on? Well, I'd like to say that we we are, but we are more of across the board. It wasn't really we went where customers needed us. So our first customer is actually in the car finance industry, right on Nissan Finance for car loans, and then I would say coincidence led us between our customers. So it wasn't really customer; it was a bit like. We try to look where customers need use us because of our unique sales proposition. So coming from, historically, we spun off the tech from an airport security company, so we're global by definition. So if you're a global player, and or you have an ambition to be a global player, we are the go-to market. So I mean, like, so that's how we started with uh, Pioneer more than 10 years ago. So they needed to do identity verification on a global level, even like in more... Um, not your standard customers like Indonesia or Africa. So so that's us. So I mean, we're across the board. I mean, we do payments, we do social, we do crypto, we do banking, we do mobility, we do sharing economy, we do HR. I mean, we are not, I mean, the product identity is a cross, is a cross vertical, cross border. It's a global pro. It's a global issue. So everybody needs identity. So, and whoever wants to work with them, we are happy to work with them. And how big is the company? 
So we are a bit more than 200 people. We've been profitable so for the last six years. Most of, I mean, besides the sales and pre-sale, most of the team is based in Israel means engineering, customer success, operation, management. Why do we do that? Because we think that everybody sitting together in the same office, yes, we are, um, I would say, uh, a 90% in the office company. There is one day during the week that it's a work from home, but the rest of it, we are in the office because we think that this uh, face-to-face interaction is very crucial to do good brainstorming, to do quick resolution. And by the way, I also think that having the customers, the people who run the customer, the CSMs, sitting next to the product people, sitting next to the, the engineering, makes the relation much more tighter and much more, I would say, committed. I mean, it's easier if you can uh, step up from your table, go to another room, you know, kick the guy in the chair and say, dude, listen, you need to help me fix this problem to my customer and just drive things much faster. So how has AI affected your business or how do you think it will? I mean, I just, I see these things of people on social media who are making money and they're not even real people. They're just, they're made up images and people. And I mean, do you see AI as being a potential challenge ahead? Funny as you say AI, I mean, let's disseminate, let's break what's the meaning. What's AI? AI is machine learning. We have actually been playing with AI since as early as 2014, 2015. So for us, it's been a tool to work with, to enhance our capabilities, to enhance our networks, and to give a better customer experience to our customers and also enhance security. There was a big leap in, uh, then it was called machine learning, they went to deep learning in 2017, 2018, and now they call it AI. So actually I, I call it, it's the evolution I call it, basically, it's the same person with a different dressing. So actually, we've been embracing it for the last, we've been working with this for the last nine years. And for us, it's a great tool to help us improve our capabilities and our models and also make our teams much more efficient. So that's internally. From the external side, definitely AI, I'll call it machine learning, which is basically about, that's what it means, what is artificial, it's machine learning. It definitely raises the bar when it comes to face new challenges, specifically when the, I'll call it like the proliferation of AI, which happened in, in 2023, which it became much more accessible to the general public. And so there's great upsides and there's also some great big downsides. And then it's just keeping us a bit more on our toes. I mean, there's a saying in our company that authentics was built by paranoids for paranoids. So it's, uh, I'll say, it's like feeding the beast with more challenges. Trying to stay a step ahead of the bad guys in a certain way. Always, always, always. Well, what would you say differentiates you guys from your competitors out there? So a couple of things. What What differentiates us is the fact that we are 100% automated. We don't use people, basically, in the process to authenticate people. I mean, most of our competitors, we call it what we use, uh, we call it hybrid. And that, that's what our shtick. Because another very big difference is that are we on our stack? So we've built all of our capabilities internally. It gives us a couple of, it gives us a few advantages. One, we control our destiny. Okay? So therefore... We're not dependent on third party, which means that one, we can control our cost. Okay. And we always thrive to become much more efficient and more capable in that respect, which is very important, specifically in these times. We were actually, I'll tell you, when I told them when I was, when I was chatting with my buddies in the industry that compete with us and they was, they are talking about us like with me all the time, but growth, growth, growth. I said, guys, the music will end. And then you need to go into profitability and it will be very difficult. If you think how you not just grow, okay, but also make it in an efficient way, it gives you much more, I'll say it can, gives you control of your destiny in a much better way. Don't forget that we've bootstrapped the, the business. So we never took external uh, VC money. We only have done a second there about four years ago. So that's another USB that we own our stack. 
which gives us the ability to be profitable, but also our scalability. I mean, there is a reason why most, now it's a bit, I know it's a bit under fashion, but why we are the go-to vendor for the crypto industry and the mobility one, because you need instant verification in four to eight seconds. You cannot wait for a person to verify in a couple of minutes that what happens with our customers. And because of that, basically, when, you know, Sunday there is like the crypto, you know, there's a bull run in the crypto for about an hour and you need to onboard like a million users. Or suddenly, let's say there's the Super Bowl game and everybody wants to get Uber Eat and who wants to do alcohol delivery and need to verify like a huge amount of people for age verification to make sure they're at the age. There's nobody that can stand like peaks and lows because we're automated and our scale. So that's another big thing. Another very big, and another stuff that, I mean, as I said, build by paranoids for paranoids. So we were the first one that went out to the market with our consortium capabilities that basically what they does is that our customers, it will happen in 2019, that our customers can talk between each other anonymously and send fraud signals. So for example, Greg, if you are a fraudster, and Santa, and you use your face with different names or different addresses or different mobile devices, we can see that you're trying to be a bit of a bad customer. And due to that, I mean, the fact that we can detect it, let's say you've done this, you use your face with one name at Uber and your face with another name at Airbnb. And basically, if we, because these things are shared, suddenly the, you know, Someone will say, hold on, can say either to, let's say, Uber or Airbnb or any of this. Listen, we've seen the Greg's face, not always with the same name. And that's relatively very powerful. But it's we, what we track is about 15 different signals, data, unique signals that, that we collected and we're growing this. And of course, we don't keep the PII. What we do is we just keep the signals of it. And that's how basically we allow our customers to the power of the network to protect each other. So that's another very big USV that we launched. This year it became a bit more fashionable. Some of our buddies in this field just launched this capability, but the fact that we've been doing this for like 19, 20, 21, 22, for five years, the, the amount of data that we've collected and signals is far beyond anybody else. Well, where do you see this space headed in the next three to five years? Listen, we need to see, technically, I would split it to two pieces, business, and tech. On the business side, listen, the market is dried up and everybody needs to make sure, needs now to show to the market that they can make the numbers work, meaning they can show profitability. And that's the big push for, I think, 2020. It started in 2023, but definitely 2024, 2025. Whoever has not been able to show a working business model will not survive. And therefore, you will not get any funding. Now, everybody's saying, yeah, I can show probably, but, you know, between saying and delivering, it's a big thing. So I think there's definitely be, going to be consolidation from a couple of, one, because of, of lack of funding. Therefore, people will start getting merged. I'm actually looking to consolidate and looking at a few acquisitions in the market because we can, what well, we we can do is any partner that we can acquire we can we can definitely uh, it will be bring us significant upside in our bottom line so that's from a technical point of view and definitely but also I'm, I'm not looking just this there won't just be consolidation in our specific market but in the general identity market i can see that some of the big data players are looking to get into our space so i probably go they might make a few acquisitions and the single sign-on companies as well trying to move from doing like business verification. I mean, like, you know, managing identities for businesses, but managing identity for consumers. So that's from a consolidation point of view. From a technical point of view, listen, I wish I would have the crystal ball, but I don't. I think definitely AI is, uh, we're just now starting, I mean, machine learning, the, the next generation is starting to bring us much more interesting stuff. And I think will help us develop new capabilities that, some of them are already cooking in our head, which I'm not going to disclose because I don't want my my competitors to learn. But also, I mean, probably we didn't even think of yet. 
and they will pop up probably along the next two to three years. And it also can help us. Again, I, listen, I'm always looking, okay, how can technology, listen, at the end of the day, how can technology makes us may help us do better and also make it more efficient? So that's another thing that, uh, that definitely the tech in the industry will help different companies in that respect. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. So tell us a little more about your journey to, to the company there and to your role there. Maybe fill in the gaps between your leaving university and starting the company. It's a long story. I'll try to make it as short as possible. So when you talk about as an individual, you need to ask yourself, what are you? What do you like doing? Are you a sales guy? Are you a product guy? Do you like to get your hands dirty? Are you an engineering guy? And I think I, when I left university, I think even before university, even you know when I was a teenager, I knew I wanted to go into business. What kind of business? I wasn't sure. And during my first part, you know, when I left the service, so when I was in my undergrad, I also worked. I was a bit bored in university, so uh, but you know, I, I, but I said, listen, I need to get the the university degree. So I was so the first year I've, I've done. I worked in accounting. So I was an assistant accountant at Toys R Us. Interesting to understand how the numbers are working. Then a year later, then a year and a half later, while I was doing some side sales on the side, I became, I went to do, I went, I sold PCs, I sold computers for Packer Bell NEC. So I was in charge of the pre and post sales for the big chain stores like Office Depot and Staples. And that was kind of fun because getting to interact with people, and, you know, to understand how big networks are working. And then, again, I look for opportunities. And then I started to get explored to the, you know, 97, 98. I was always on the internet, but, you know, I got really explored to media and streaming and localization of channels. So I had a small company that did localization for TV channels in Israel. And then, you know, a year later, you know, their biggest investment bank in Israel was looking to do IPOs in the U.S. and Israel. Internet companies, they were looking for somebody that knows the, the internet sector quite well. And they were looking for an analyst to write papers. And I was hired. So I had a financial background, but they taught me how to write sell-side reports. So I was was during the bubble days. I mean, like the 99, 2000, 2001. So for two plus years, I worked there. It was great fun. I learned how to do underwriting, how you raise money, how you sell to the public markets. And then the... I'll say the market crashed and I decided to go do my MBA. I never took a year from life. So my MBA was a bit of a break from life. So I went to London and then I got a taste for finance and I wanted to do uh, some funding. I mean, to work in a, in a, in a fund, but the market was very dried up in 2000 and when I finished my MBA at the end of 2002. So I went back to Israel and then I bumped to a friend of mine who was looking for a good business guy to join a startup in the social media analytics space. Talked to you about 2003, Facebook was just starting a year later. So we were selling uh, data analysis on forums and blogs. So that's a really good di- deep dive into that space. Then I left that company, I, I started my own. And for about four years, I've built a company that does uh, sentiment analysis on social media. And then 2008 happened. And I don't need to tell you 2008, no, the whole market crashed couldn't get funding for my previous company. And uh, I had a few customers left, mostly be healthcare, but, you know, I didn't want to make it a boutique company, so I decided to shut it down. And then uh, I was looking to another company, and then my dad, one of the chances of my dad, my dad says, what are you going to do now? I said, I think I'm going to do another startup. And then he told me, listen, why don't you come work, well, you know, work for me? I said, yeah, dad, what's the story? I said, listen, I own an airport, so we, he got to own an airport security company. It's a long story. We got into this. And inside the airport security company, there was a small engineering team that does passport authentication for airports, for immigration. And he says, listen, I read an article about banks getting fined from not doing proper KYC. And one of the KYC is checking documents. And he says, and he told me, let's go sell to, let's go sell to banks. I said, okay. What do you know about banks? Nothing. And I said, I'm up to the challenge. So I took the, the leadership role, 15 guys. So, okay, how do we do product market fit? So I took the basic product that we used to sell to governments and I went to sell it to one of the banks in Israel. And, the, and it's, a, it's a very fascinating story. I sold it. I didn't sell a lot. I sold about 20 pieces of it. Like at the time I sold the license. And guys, I mean, I know everybody doesn't know what's like. Everybody knows SaaS. But 15 years ago, 
you used to sell licenses. So you sold the license, like you paid, I don't know, like the argument's like a thousand dollar, and then you paid another twenty percent maintenance every year on the license. And that's sorry. And when I saw to that guy at the bank, it was actually one of the veterans guy, and we really clicked well. And he told me, listen, Ron, you know, you're not really selling compliance, you're selling operation efficiency. And I said, okay, tell me. And then explain how the banks work, the digitizing and archiving and everything is a big problem. It's very costly. And I start to understand, okay, what are the key? So it's not just, and this was 2000 pre-fintech, it's not just compliance. There's a whole array that comes with the compliance, the efficiencies, the archive, the data cleanliness, everything. And, uh, and of, because Israel is a very small market, the next market I went to was uh, UK because I didn't have a lot of money. I was very limited in my budget. And also, I knew Experian from my previous startup. It's another interesting story. So I went to Experian. We've done a partnership with them. They introduced me to some of the banks, done some pitches. They really liked the product. But the problem was, I'm talking about 2009, it was an on-prem solution. The integration of the point of sale was like, challenging, I'll say this. We're not talking about APIs. And I did sell to a bit less of a low-touch customers like Renault Nissan, where the integration was much simpler. And by that was the first time when I moved from a license to a per seat model. So every every installation, they paid me an annual seat license, which is getting closer to SaaS. And but you know, I wasn't really taking off. And I was, you know, I was scratching my head, okay, what if what I'm gonna do? And, you know, like in life and like everything in life, while I was, uh, one day I was with my kids at the beach, I bumped into a friend of mine and he was working for a small fintech company. And he told me about his challenges about onboarding customers remote, getting like IDs via fax. And again, people doesn't know, people still remember what our faxes is and, and emails and uploads. And he said, listen, can you automate for me the process? I said, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a, you know, it's an interesting twist. So I started getting into this and I, and, you know, I saw, and it was early, early days of the fintechs. So I went back to the drawing board and I need to re, basically reconfigure the whole system because in the previous, in the, in the early days, it was in client server configuration, depending on the hardware. So we disconnect from the hardware piece. We disconnect from the front end piece and we built it basically as a, as a backend service independent of anything that I can install and get them and get the images and build them. So it took me about a year to rewrite the code. I didn't write the code. I'm not a coder. I'm, I'm a, more of a sales guy, but I knew what we needed. Okay. And I worked with the product and, and the R&D team, okay, to, to basically to build the product market fit. And then in 2012, we went out with a new product. And again, like everything in life, be a friend. I got a meeting with PayPal and I got a meeting with Payoneer. And they both liked it, but Pioneer was a bit faster to move it. it the paper they took a bit longer, but Pioneer a year later, uh, Pioneer nine months later, actually not even quicker, signed a contract. And we actually, that was the first time I sold SaaS. I sold per transaction, not per, um, I built a license fee. And um, it was an on-prem solution, by the way. And then a year later, listen, it's all coincidence. I don't, don't ask me even how. I mean, of course, I tried. Listen, I always had a wish list who I want to work with, so I always attack them. But, you know, by coincidence, we bumped into the right guy inside the Google team. And they were at the time, they wanted to launch Google Wallet. They wanted the time to, to go head to head with PayPal. And they needed a, solu- a global solution. And they really dig their product because it was fully automated. Unlike the other two vendors that exist in the market, there's a must there, like, I don't know, like 15 players. And, but they told me, listen, there's no way you can install on Google production and said, you want to work with us? You need to, to, you need to go to the cloud. So actually they pushed us to the cloud. There was no G cloud. There was only AWS and Azure. We went on Azure because we had a bit of a, uh, not, not anymore now, but historically we're a .NET platform and the rest is history. And then later PayPal signed with us. It took them a while. I mean, it's okay. I mean, they're great customers been a very good and loyal partner for the last almost even like I'm talking about eight, nine years. And, you know, I think that we've delivered and I think that from a business point of view, I always wanted to give a wide love service and to be very hands on, even when we're not always perfect. Nobody can be. Per- I mean, we're never perfect. OK, but 
you can't be always like at the top of your game. You always there are always bugs and fixes, and you always need to adjust. But we are always very open and for criticism and to learn from our mistakes. And in our vision, we want to give a, a wide glass service. So we try that all the time. And so that's how we grew the business. And, and basically, we grew word, word of mouth. You know, at the end of the day, if you deliver a good service, customers will come to you. I can tell you the last one that is coming to us now, again, came from one of, yeah, I just had a very interesting meeting with another very big tech, big internet tech company. And I, and I asked them, okay, so how did you get to us? I said, well, a specific company, another very, very big tech company from Silicon Valley said, that they work with you and they were tested everything and that we should work with you as well. So that's always a very good way to get customers because they already heard from someone else and word of mouth, I think, is the best selling tool that exists in the market. So that's a bit of a of a nutshell of, you know, the story of Authentics and how we got to where we are today. It's fascinating and just pivoting at every, you know, to use a more modern term, pivoting at all these different places and angles throughout the company and your career. It's a fascinating story for sure. Listen, the cycles are getting shorter and you need first of all to embrace them. And you need to also understand how you're going to deal with it. And I think, I think, you know, you need, listen, it's a problem, fix it. So, and, and, you know, I like fixing problems, fixing my customer's problem, our customer problem. I think that's one of the key things that drives Authentics. And in that process, we have our own problems and we need to fix it. And I think the one of the greatest things that if someone asks me, what do they, so you have a challenge, so what? Go fix it. There is always a solution to a problem. The fact, as a saying of a, an old friend of my dad um, said, if you haven't solved the problem, it means that you haven't thought hard enough. So think hard. Eventually you're going to find a solution. I love that. So one final question, Ron. So what are you passionate about? So maybe one work-related passion and one personal passion. I love people. So I love the interaction. I love the interaction with the customers. I love the interaction with my colleagues. My mother, I'll, I'll tell you a funny joke. You know, my mother sent me to, to study coding at the age of 10. After I said, damn, mom, listen, it's not for me. I'm not the kind of guy to sit behind a computer and code all day. It's, it's not my type. I, I need the social interaction. That's, that's my passion about work. My personal family, of course, is I'm very passionate about my family. I have, uh, I have four kids. Actually, I need to fix it. They don't like to say, I have four daughters. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my, when I said I have four kids, my, so my daughter said, Dad, you don't have four kids. You have four daughters. <laughs> so I'm crazy. a father of four daughters. And I think that, you know, I, I Try to have a relaxed life, but I love, but thing that I'm very, is music. I love music. I think music is, uh, you know, people like, I love just, you know, I'd like to, I love, love live music. I used to DJ in my dark ages and um, it's just not dark. I'm just fun being a bit like sarcastic about it, but I love live concerts, any music, you know, it could be jazz, classic, rock, new wave, metal, R&B, reggae, techno. So music is, a, it does go to the spirit. I think, you know, in order to, uh, I think, you know, you need, try to think positive, trying to be optimistic. I think music helps me give a bit of a good vibe to life. I would agree with you there. And sounds like you might be good at some uh, music trivia games. I don't know if you watch any of those on TV, but uh, there's quite a few of them out there now. I think you'd be very good at that. I hope. <laughs> I'm very bad with names, but, you know, I can tell you where, I mean, but if you let me Google it, I'll find it very, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm very bad with names, but, uh, but the music I recognize super fast. So I have, a, I have a very good music memory, but names is like, I'm horrible at names. <laughs> Well, great. Well, Ron, we've covered a lot of ground so far about obviously you and the company and the industry. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up the show? I think we've done a nice coverage. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. And it was great to learn more about the company and how you guys are leading the market. And obviously your your background and story is, is fascinating in and of itself. So thank you so much for being on the show. I know your time is valuable. So I really appreciate you being here. Greg, thank you very much for the time and thank you very much for the opportunity. And um Looking forward to speaking to you sometime in the future. Okay. And to all your listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. 
Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well.